Uh, welcome to part two of our advanced topics midterm review. Uh, we're picking up with this, these questions on lattice energy. Uh, just so <clears throat> it's clear to you what we're talking about, remember there are strong attractions uh, between the positive and negative ions in a lattice of an ionic compound. And in order to overcome this amount of attraction, right, strong pull towards each other, we have to supply a certain amount of energy. Now, there's some, uh, there's some additional information I have to give you about this when we quantify the energy, but we're just going to be uh, sim simplistic about it and just say it's the amount of energy needed to vaporize this particular sample. All right? Now, we're not going to calculate actual values. We're going to calculate relative values. Um, let's just look at each question. Uh, it's asking whether KCl or CaCl2 should have a, a higher lattice energy. Well, the main determining factor, the most important determining factor for uh, in the comparison of one uh, crystal's lattice energy to another's is how big their charges are. Notice K is positive 1, Cl is minus 1. Uh, Ca is positive 2, Cl is negative 1. So we would consider CaCl2 as having the greater lattice energy due to having greater uh, either positive or negative charges. Uh, B, by the same approach, I see that Ca is positive 2 and O is negative 2. Strontium is positive 2, O is negative 2. Well, that's tied. Uh, we use radius as a tiebreaker. If we consider the relative positions of Ca and Sr, we notice that Ca is higher in its group than Sr, which means that it is, has a smaller radius. It turns out that a smaller radius, uh, or an ion with a smaller radius, is going to be more attractive to its neighboring oxygen than is the larger radius. So that means the smaller the radius, the greater the lattice energy. The greater lattice energy. So that means that CaO would have to have the greater lattice energy. Uh, part C, CaI versus CSBR. Ca is plus 2, I is minus 1. CS is plus 1, BR is minus 1. Greater charges, either positive charges or negative charges, are greater. So that means CAI has the greater lattice energy. Na3N, question D, Na3N or NAF. Na is plus 1, N is minus 3. Na is plus 1, F is minus 1. Well, notice that N has a greater negative charge than F does, or has a a greater quantity of charge with a negative sign. So that means that Na3N is going to be the one that has the greater lattice energy. Again, that's what you look at first. First, you look at charges. In the situation where charges are the same in both compounds, you use a radius as a tiebreaker. 8A and B concern uh, dot diagrams for, uh, for molecules. Uh, this was underneath uh, under the title of VSEPR, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And according to the theory, we proceed in this way. Uh, first of all, I'm going to add up the total number of valence electrons that I have in that molecule, which is, which is 24. Uh, boron has three valence electrons. Each fluorine has seven for a total of 24. Uh, I start off by situating my central atom. And I put my side atoms, of course, around the central atom. And I'm going to connect uh, the side atoms with single bonds to the central atom. And of course, I'm going to make my outer, elect uh, outer atoms uh, happy with, according to the octet rule, in other, in other words, according to the theory, uh, the side atoms always get eight, unless you're hydrogen when you only can have two. But the question is, am I done? Well, I do a count. Notice I have 8 plus 8 plus 8. Guys, I'm done. All that's left now is to go to part B and to see what's the shape of the molecule. Well, 
Uh, I have to count up the number of bonding domains and the number of non-bonding domains on the molecule. Well, bonding domains means number of bonds, bonding areas that are touching. There are three such areas. And notice there are no loner pairs of electrons, or I should say uh, non-bonding pairs of electrons out here. So that's zero. Well, I go to my table. I say three bonding domains, zero non-bonding. That means the shape of the molecule's trig trigonal planar. Notice I drew it that way just because I happen to know how it would look. If you happen to you know, draw it like this, don't worry about it. The only reason we draw the molecule is to get the information we need to come to this table and figure out what the shape of the molecule is. On number nine, uh, we've given you a Lewis dot structure for the sulfate ion, and we want you to calculate something called formal charge. Uh, formal charge is really a means by which we can determine whether a molecule uh, is, even though it can be drawn according in a certain according to a certain uh, Lewis dot diagram, whether that Lewis dot diagram is likely to show up in nature. Now we're not going to go into any more of an explanation. I merely have to tell you how to calculate formal charge. Formal charge is uh, the formal charge on a given atom. So notice here, I would like to figure out the formal charge on sulfur and the formal charge on each of the identical oxygens. What I do is I first look up the number of valence electrons in that particular atom, and I'm going to subtract two things from that. I'm going to subtract the number of non-bonding electrons uh, that are on that particular atom, and I'm also going to subtract the number of bonds that are touching the atom. That's one way of putting it. So let's look at sulfur. When I look up sulfur, I see that it has six valence electrons, 286. I look at sulfur, and I see that there are no non-bonding electrons on it meaning zero. I do see that there are one, two, three, four bonds touching it. So very simply, six minus four is a positive two. That's its formal charge. Oxygen is two, eight, is two, six, I should say. So it also has six valence electrons. So they're in the same group, not surprising though. Uh, notice, unlike the sulfur, each oxygen has two, four, six, eight non-bonding electrons. And there is one bond combining or touching it, combining it with uh, to the sulfur. So very simply, six minus seven is a negative one. So that is the, the formal charge of sulfur and oxygen in that particular dot diagram. And number ten, um, draw the electron dot diagram of the polyatomic ion carbonate. CO3 with a minus 2 charge. Be sure to draw all resonance structures in which carbon obeys the octet rule. Well, this is to be very simple about this. First of all, when you have a resonance structure, that implies that a molecule has uh, at least one double bond. Or maybe it's better to say has one double bond and the rest single bonds. So what that means is if I want to draw the dot diagram of CO3 with a minus 2 charge, I do I have the same approach as previously. I draw a carbon in the center, that's the, the central atom. I draw the O's around it, and normally I would just draw single bonds, but because I told you when you see the word resonance, you're going to put a double bond somewhere. Where? Well, it's, that's actually the interesting question. Uh, you can put it wherever you want initially. That's totally fine. Now, of course, you want to make all of your side uh, atoms happy. So that means two, four, six, eight options feeling great. Two, four, six, eight options feeling great. Two, four, six, eight options feeling great. And of course, it's a, poly, it's a polyatomic ion, so I have to show that it has a negative two charge. Well, back to the question, where do I put this double bond? Well, it, it, it turns out that if this double bond could be here, it could be over in this domain, or it could be in that domain as well. So when I draw resonance structures, I'm rewriting all the possible ways that I could position that double bond. 
For example, I think the molecule could look like this because I shifted the double bond over here. But of course, I need to make sure that each O uh, has the correct number. So whereas over here, that O had three non-bonding pairs, over here, it can only have two non-bonding pairs to keep it with a happy eight. There's one final way of drawing, of positioning that double bond. It's like this. Voila. Uh, notice also I draw these uh, arrows going back and forth. It, we imagine that we are resonating between forms. We're jumping back and forth. Uh, this double bond is jumping around from different position to position, which is a simplification. It's not really doing that, but it's an approximation. It's, it's a good analogy. It's an approximation, and uh, it gets us the right sort of answers for it. Uh, finally, uh, the bond length of CO is 143, and the bond length, the double bond, is 122 picometers. Let me point something out to you first. We're telling you that a single bond is longer than a double bond. And that means a pure single bond. This is a pure single bond has this bond length. And a pure double bond has this bond length. It turns out that these, as a result of resonance, is, are not true double and single bonds. Because it turns out that this bond domain at this moment is a double bond. Here it's a single bond, here it's a single bond. So as a result, it's gonna be, it spends parts of, it, of its time as a shorter double bond and the rest of its time as a longer single bond. That means on average, this domain has a bond length that's gonna be longer than the short double bond, but shorter than the long double bond, than the, than the long single bond. Uh, how can I actually calculate this number? Well, let me show you. The actual bond length is the number of bonds divided by the number of bond domains. So notice, in any of these molecules, there are one, two, three bonding domains. However, there are one, two, three, four bonds distributed over that. So it's not a single bond. It's not a double bond. It's a 1.333 bond, meaning it's longer than a double bond. However, it is shorter than, I'll put it this way, it is longer than a double bond, but it's going to be shorter than a single bond. Now to the question. Estimate the bond length of the bond between the carbon and oxygen in the carbonate ion. Well, let's put it this way. Let's say that the math had worked out and we had gotten a one and a half bond, like so. Well, a one and a half bond is equally, is equally between the length of a single bond and a double bond. So in that case, I could just take the average of 143 and 122, which is the average would be 133 picometers. So again, if this were equally equally single and double bond for the strict average, the length would be 133 picometers. But notice it's not at a one and a half bond, it's a 1.33 bond, which is actually equally between 143 and 133. So I guess that would put somewhere in the area, the average would be about 138 picometers. And that allows us, with that, we have finished part two. I hope you have found this helpful. Um, seek us out. We can give you more practice with this. And uh, bye-bye.